Good morning. We come on the air with breaking news. Former President Donald Trump set to arrive at any moment at a New York City courthouse as the beginning of his first criminal trial against a former president. As that gets underway in just a few minutes, jury selection up first, a process expected to take at least several days, if not more. Our cameras are right there waiting for the arrival of the former president. Over the next few days, 12 jurors and six alternates have to be selected to hear the case. And we have our cameras high in the sky watching the president's motorcade as he arrives in downtown Manhattan for this trial. He faces 34 counts of falsifying business records. These are related to hush money payments made in 2016 in the closing weeks of the campaign to adult film actress Stormy Daniels. Those payments took place through his then attorney, Michael Cohen, who has since pleaded guilty and will testify in this matter. And the payments, as mentioned, came near the end of his first campaign for president. We've got our reporters fanned out this morning, the former president denying any wrongdoing in the case and says he will testify at the trial. Laura Jarrett is there in position. So, Laura, set this up for us. What are we about to see? Savannah, an unprecedented moment playing out here in Lower Manhattan. The former president's motorcade just arriving here at the courthouse as he sets to go in for day one of what will be a historic moment for the country. For him, this trial, actually quite simple, Savannah, as you laid out, 34 felony counts, all having to do with what prosecutors say was an illegal scheme to cover up a hush money payment in the waning days of the 2016 election. We call it the hush money case, but in fact, Prosecutors have tried to craft it as far more broad, potentially much more significant, having to do with what they think is election interference, a scheme to try to hide permanent information, an alleged affair from the voters in 2016. The former president obviously denies all the charges. He denies knowing about the scheme, the plot. He denies that the affair ever happened. He pled not guilty. He has tried to fight this case tooth and nail for the better part of a year, but lost all of his appeals. And that is why he is here today for the beginning of jury selection, Savannah. All right, Laura, stand by there. We've heard that the former president has entered the courthouse and we've got cameras in there. We are allowed to shoot comings and goings outside the courtroom. There will be no camera or audio recording of this trial, including jury selection, which is about to get underway. With me here, we also have senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalo. So, Hallie, um, the former president has been defiant. Yes. He has used these criminal matters. There are four cases pending against him. This is the first to see trial. He's used them to his advantage in the Republican primary. Now we're in a general election. How do you think this plays? He has to be in court every single day for this criminal trial. Super important, boy, because what we're about to see now from these hallway cameras is what we are going to see from the former president for weeks to come, likely. He has an opportunity to stop if he wants to, to talk to reporters, to be visible, to be present. It is not a campaign rally, but it is absolutely the collision of the campaign trail and the courtroom here. We know that. That is how he has tried to use this to his advantage. I'm told by a senior advisor that the former president feels defiant today, as he has now for, for months, ever since he has started to, um, and for years really, convey all of these uh, legal issues against him as the idea that he is being, as he sees it, a victim of political persecution. Now, in the Republican primary, this was gangbusters for him. He did very well from a support perspective. He consolidated the GOP party largely around him in the primary. He raised a ton of money, millions of dollars, after the indictments came down in each of these cases. The question is, will that hold for a general election? Recent polling shows that about half of Americans, 44%, Say it doesn't matter what we see through the course of these trials, whether former President Trump is convicted. But you know who doesn't think that necessarily? About a third of independents, 36 percent, who say, yeah, they are less likely to vote for the former president if, in fact, he ends up with a conviction. Keep in mind, he can still run for president if this trial goes through, if he ends up with a conviction. There is no there is nothing constitutionally that says that he can no longer run, that he would have to drop out at that point. No, and even though, as I turn to Danny Savalas, a practicing lawyer, a defense lawyer, in some ways, this is something so ordinary, a criminal case in a, the Manhattan courthouse and in other ways so extraordinary. We've never seen this. We've never seen a former president go on trial in a criminal matter. So now jury selection. This is a Manhattan uh, jury that will be selected, not Trump country. So how will they go about finding a jury that can be fair? Judge Mershon has made it clear that someone's political affiliation, who they voted for, is not a factor that will automatically exclude someone from this jury. And the jury questionnaire reflects that. 42 questions, not one of them is, who did you vote for in the last election? But Judge Mershon said, and you can see for yourself, 
you're going to be able to get a pretty good idea of where someone stands by their answers to the questions on the questionnaire. For example, the question, are you a member of Antifa or the Proud Boys? That's going to probably give you a pretty good idea where someone stands politically. Have you ever attended a Donald Trump rally? The answer to that question, if it's in the affirmative, will give you a pretty good idea of how this particular juror votes. But the mere fact that they may not uh, have voted for Donald Trump, the mere fact that they may not even like Donald Trump, will not disqualify people from this jury. The test is and has always been, given what you know or think about this particular defendant, can you set those ideas aside and judge this case fairly on the facts and the evidence? The challenge here is just realism. This is someone that is so divisive in this country, and we're in a county that voted overwhelmingly for President Biden. Uh, how do you suss through that? Because I actually think normally people try to get off jury duty. I actually think something they really need to guard for here is what we call the stealth juror, somebody who will appear very plain, very neutral, but maybe wants to get on this jury, maybe because they have an agenda or maybe simply because they know this is a part of history and they want to be part of history. And that can cut both ways. A stealth juror, I mean, it only takes one juror to, be, ha, to, to for, side with the former president and you have a hung jury. So you, you need a, a unanimous jury to get a conviction in this case. Exactly right. It's often said that it only takes one. It only takes one to hang a jury. But, you know, the reality is, as jurors deliberate, if you only have one or two in the room, they usually get harangued into changing their vote. So you typically want more than one or two. But you're right that just one juror can hang the entire case. And by the way, some of the traditional thoughts about jury selection are kind of flipped on their head here. I, whereas normally a defense attorney like me, if somebody comes in and they have a connection to law enforcement or an affinity for law enforcement, you want them off that jury. Maybe in a case like this, that's exactly who Donald Trump wants on the jury, given voting patterns and other things that are beyond my Ken and more Halley's area. But this is a very unique jury selection. And just lastly, Lawyers are actually involved in jury selection in New York, which is very unusual. In federal court, for example, I don't say a word until I'm spoken to by the judge. In New York, they have one-on-one -on -one access by questioning these jurors. Which is an opportunity for both sides to kind of seed the facts and seed exactly. arguments early on with the jury pool. Let me turn back to Laura Jarrett, because we are awaiting the former president to walk into that courtroom. Just the specter of that, Laura, he is required to be there every single day. He has indicated that he wants to testify. If he does, his lawyers can't stop him from doing so. How do you expect that to play out day by day? Well, the trick of it is, Savannah, that he's been in this courtroom before. He's been here, obviously, for his arraignment and several pretrial hearings. But this is different. His appearance here is not voluntary. He's required to be here unless he gets special dispensation for some reason for the judge. And the judge has made it very clear he expects him to be here every single day, um, which in the middle of a re-election campaign is also uh, just extraordinary and uh, unprecedented if you really think about it. Um, it'll be interesting to see who's really driving this. When you get down to it, you talk about him saying that he wants to testify. That obviously poses extreme risks for him of cross-examination. Obviously, he would be able, uh, he would be in the witness chair there under oath and would have to testify truthfully in front of this jury as they assess his credibility. And we've seen him testify before, just recently in his civil fraud trial. He insisted upon testifying in that case, and we all know how that one turned out. So it may be the case that he doesn't testify, in which case the prosecution can't comment on that in front of the jury. He has a right not to testify, just like any other defendant. But I think throughout this trial, we're going to see sort of the power struggle between what Donald Trump, the candidate, wants to do and what his lawyers might think is in the best interest for him legally. All right. We've also got Meet the Press moderator Kristen Welker with us from Washington. The question of whether he testifies in court, there's uh, probably no question he'll testify on the courthouse steps to, in, in a certain way, although there is a partial gag order in the case. What is the Trump strategy as this case unfolds. He's off the campaign trail and in a courtroom. How does he intend to balance those things? Savannah, it's a great question. We've seen it play out uh, throughout his previous court cases in which he has made use of the cameras outside the courtroom. I am told by an advisor close to former President Donald Trump, expect to see the same in this case, that he, his team, ready to make use of every avenue of the media possible.
no surprise there. He's a former reality TV star, after all, so he knows how to do this. Savannah, he has also been very clear that he plans to be out on the campaign trail as much as he can after court. Court's not going to be in session on Wednesday, so expect to see him out on the campaign trail uh, as well, potentially. Those days, he's close to nearby Pennsylvania, big battleground state. Expect to see President Biden in Pennsylvania, by the way, this week. He has three separate stops in Pennsylvania. He's going to try to counter-program all of this, Savannah. I am told don't expect the current commander-in-chief to talk directly about this court case. Instead, he's going to be talking about things like the economy, abortion, other issues that he thinks will resonate. And if you think about the polling, Savannah, we just got new polling nationally showing that this race is as tight as a tick. So all of this could potentially resonate with moderates, independents in those critical battleground states, Savannah. Kristen, we continue to keep our eye on those doors. We do expect former President Donald Trump to walk in as his criminal trial, an unprecedented moment in American history, a criminal trial for a former president begins any minute now with jury selection. I want to turn to Danny Savalos, one of the lawyers on our panel this morning. Let's talk about the case. There are four cases pending, criminal cases pending against the former president. This is a New York state case. It is the first to go to trial. There has been a lot of analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of the various cases. This case is widely considered to be the weakest legally. Why is that? It's probably the most defensible for a, a number of reasons. Number one, the original theory of the case is that Trump falsified business records. And additionally, because he was doing that to conceal another crime, it gets elevated to a felony in New York. But that other crime that he was allegedly concealing is essentially a federal campaign violation, which uh, really is an unusual place. It's a novel theory. It's never really been tested in New York courts. The falsification of business records has surely been tested many times. It's a crime that is prosecuted, not every day and all the time, but a crime that is prosecuted. So the prosecution need, must only must prove not only that the business records were falsified, but additionally that it was in concealment of a crime. And so the defense there could simply be, no, it wasn't for campaign purposes. It was just to reduce the embarrassment that I would have with Melania. It was just because this was a personal issue and I wanted to hide these payments. Or you might see a defense of, I don't know anything about that. Those are other people. Michael Cohen acted on his own. Uh, but that's why I suspect you see such witnesses as Madeleine Westerhout and Hope Hicks. These are people that were around him and maybe heard him talk about these things. And of course, Michael Cohen has some credibility issues. But I, I have to say, that is classic a classic uh, thing that all cooperating witnesses have. If he's introducing documents, the people, the prosecution will say the documents speak for themselves no matter how much Michael Cohen lacks credit. Yeah, let me talk, talk to Laura about that matter. Michael Cohen is the former lawyer. He is the person who actually executed these payments and then later were, was reimbursed. He has pleaded guilty. Uh, and when you have a cooperating witness like that who has, has flipped and turned state's evidence, they have credibility problems. So the prosecutors will have to shore him up with corroborating evidence. They are. They're going to have to try to use some documentary evidence. Obviously, there's at least one recording that we know about, not about Stormy Daniels, the porn star who's involved in this honey, hush money payment. But there's another one where the former president is on tape discussing sort of how these reimbursement schemes are going to work. Prosecutors are going to want to bring in all of that to try to flesh out the story, Savannah. They want to show a pattern of not just suppressing this one woman's story, but a bunch of stories leading up to the election, all in service of trying to keep what they say prosecutors say was damaging information from the voters. As Danny laid out, though, of course, the defense is going to continually say this wasn't about keeping information from the voters because the voters would have never seen how I was documenting this on my books and records. Instead, this was a personal issue. This was about embarrassment. This was about keeping the issue from his wife, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. And Holly, I mean, we we, we don't know how the public will react to how this will play sure. politically. But of all the, fa the facts that are pending, this is certainly the seemiest. This is the scummiest the set of facts. details. Yes. The, yes. And so how does that play? It's a set of facts that was also known before the former president was elected in 2016. I mean, they're, they're, the information that is being presented to the jury here was in the public sphere, in the public eye, prior to election day. But he 2016. paint off a porn star yeah, right. who he acknowledges having a, a he says, consensual 
affair with. Denies any wrongdoing in this situation, obviously. But the, the politics of it is interesting because the timing piece of it, Savannah. I mean, you brought up the idea that this is perceived to be potentially the weakest case from a legal perspective. Those close to the former president see a political advantage in this case coming up first and not the federal election interference case and not the case involving the mishandling allegedly of classified documents here. So the fact that this is the one that we're sitting here talking about that is in the public eye right now, they see this as potentially useful because of the fact um, that it is known information, because of the fact that it is happening in New York City, where the former president has and can say, look, it's it's Manhattan. It's a bunch of Democrats here who are looking to be, quote unquote, out to get me, as he has often put it before. We're talking about some of the names coming up. You can be forgiven for flashing back to 2016. That is what the vibes are here. People like Hope Hicks, who we haven't really seen or heard from publicly in years. Well, Stormy Daniels, Stormy Daniels. The, the former adult film actress, will testify. Karen McDougal, who is another woman who claims to have an affair and have been paid off by Trump allies to be right. silenced, to catch and kill that story, right. essentially. She may be a potential the witness. The National Enquirer folks who were involved in that so-called catch and kill scheme, as you see, the list of potential witnesses here, which we will, we are expecting to find out more about possibly as early as today. I mean, these are all names, Savannah, that we were having conversations about during the campaign in 2016, who are coming back now and reliving, as, as you put it, um, some of those seamy details, if you will, of what exactly happened here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Danny, I mean, one of the issues, and we only have a couple seconds left, is, is timing. Because th the former president can say, look, this was a personal matter. I use personal funds. These are my business records. No one's relying on them. But the flip side to that argument is, well, then why did you do it in the waning days of the 2016 election? This story had been out there for much longer than that. Exactly right. The timing here is probably the prosecution's best piece of evidence. Had it happened a year, maybe two before, then there is no case. So the prosecution really needs to tie together that timing uh, to go against the defense's plan of saying this is really just about a personal payment. All right. Well, Danny Savalas, thank you so much. Hallie Lorgerard at the courthouse and Kristen Welker. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't miss the Today Show every weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 Pacific on our streaming channel, Today All Day. To watch, head to today.com slash all day or click the link right here.